contribute to these important statements today. They come with a moment of huge sensitivity for the island as we solemnly remember the victims of Bloody Sunday in Derry, but also a sensitive time for the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement and to be, and to be said, the conduct of our co-guarantor of that agreement in relation to legacy, but also on the question of protocol, if I can get to that. I too am a member of the Committee on the Implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, chaired by my party colleague Fergus O'Dowd, uh, and it's a privilege to be on that committee and to be joined by MPs and MLAs from Northern Ireland, and for us to have the benefit of that experience and that shared knowledge as we work through our groups. And I wanted to mention three groups, but let me start with the most important, victims and their families. And of course, this weekend marked the 50th anniversary of the utterly offensive and indefensible murder of civilians in Derry. Their families, their communities still feel the hurt to this day as they were mowed down down by paratroopers acting with complete inhumanity, entirely outside every law of the land and any law of humanity. The victims' names besmirched following the event, the internment of members of the community left behind. It was among the darkest of many, many dark days in Northern Ireland of its time. But the treatment of those families in the Widgery Report and the many years to follow con that continued state-sponsored hurt and pain felt to this day, and they are by no means the only ones. The Springhill and Bally Ballymurphy families, whom we met in November, with their pain again all too too raw, but at least their experience vindicated at least by the Ballymurphy inquest in May of last year. And the damaging and unhelpful proposals by the British government to allow an amnesty to not pursue these cases of justice has been widely rejected and criticised in this House and across Northern Ireland, and I want to join that course of condemnation of these unacceptable proposals. Because victims of violence, all victims of violence and their families deserve justice. And in contrast to the turn of the back and the close of the heart, it seems, given by the British government on their proposals on legacy, we want to turn towards victims and pay our respect and our true recognition to those victims of every community, as my colleague Fergus O'Dowd has said, in their search for justice. And in that vein, and again at their specific request, I too want to highlight the case of the families of the disappeared, whom we met in Belfast as a committee in November, and again in the committee rooms here in this house in December, who would simply like to give their family members a Christian burial. They have called both privately in our meetings and publicly in our committee room, specifically on members of Sinn Féin, to really do everything that they can at this stage to help achieve that. These families have asked me and others to continue to raise this in this House and publicly while there is still some chance as we go into yet another spring and there is some chance to recover a body in a bog because we also met with the Commission to recover the remains and they know that every spring counts, that every piece of information counts as they go through more and more and more bog and forest and territory with yet no recovery. So I reiterate the calls made in the committee and countless times before of Dimpna and Oliver McVeigh, brother and sister of Columba, and Maria Linsky, sister of Joe's, that we would use our voices in the doll again to call for help in their final years to recover their bodies. They deserve peace also. And their killers, like the killers in Derry, deserve no amnesty either. Um, but these are issues of the past, they persist into the hurt of today, but of course we have to look at Northern Ireland today and again we face challenges, it has to be said, by the British government with the protocol and the operation of that. British government representatives in Dublin and elsewhere tell us privately about the difficulties of the protocol for business, but very, very little about the opportunities for Northern Ireland and for business in Northern Ireland. We had the good fortune to meet the London Dairy Chamber of Commerce before Christmas, where we asked Chief Executive um, Paul Clancy about their members' experience of sector by sector in Derry about business in Northern Ireland from their own survey data and their view was look the protocol is working for us there are some issues some technical issues but the opportunity is a bigger opportunity than any hindrance and they say that that experience is replicated across Northern Ireland when they have conversations with their sister chamber groups across across Northern Ireland they say stability is needed but they'll make it work we also asked business leaders about the quality of communication that they had received from British government we keep hearing about how everything is so difficult, but we're not hearing anything about the opportunities created by the unique circumstances of the protocol for Northern Ireland. Business leaders say Northern Ireland say that communication with the executive is very good, it's very straightforward, and they have very good access, but that it's simply just not there with the British government, either in terms of accessibility or quality. There are other priorities, as it were, with regard to what's going on, either in England, Scotland, or Wales, rather than what's happening in Northern Ireland. And that's a quote from our committee. That is their view. And I highlight its importance because we cannot continue to neglect these issues or, and fail to call out the conduct of the British government on all of these matters. But finally, to the future, 
We're a little over um, a short while away from the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And though we've had great stability and good recovery in those 25 years, there is so much, left, so much work left to be done for true, and I mean true, reconciliation and the enhancement of mutual trust and understanding between communities. To that end, last week we had the good fortune to meet the Integrated Education Fund, uh, and I truly believe that there's so much work yet to be done. Let me leave you with a quote from Paul Collin from the IEF, who described the system that's there at the moment which creates a group of young people divided into two tribes with no knowledge of each other. And he told us the story of two tiny neighbourhood four-year-old friends walking down the lane, one turning to the right, one turning to the left, as they went to their separate schools to begin their division into separate identities at just age four.